Hey, uh, this is Stacia, and I'm going to share my game two, or round two game, at Parma on my victory night. <laughs> now, this game is super interesting. I actually hope to learn a lot from this game. Um, I played someone that I like and respect quite a lot. His name is Butch Kless, and he's been known and been a great part of the chess community in Cleveland for many years. Um, Butch hasn't been around the last few years. I don't think I've seen him since the pandemic until recently. So it was a real joy when I started seeing him at the chess club these past couple weeks. Um, as well as a buddy of his, Jesse Manson. <laughs> Got a shout out to Jesse, who I de definitely respect a lot, especially the way he plays. But he's also a very strong player. I think been 2000, 2100. So I definitely rank him up there. Um, so Butch uh, and I have played in the past, but I am a totally different player now. And hopefully I'm stronger. So I was looking to prove that in this game. And I think that I did. <laughs> but, you know, it's nothing against Butch. He's probably rusty. And I think he went for a strategy that did not pay off. So we will talk about that. But let's get started. So... I had white this game and I went pawn to e4 because, you know, best by test. That's what Bobby Fisher said. d6 by Bush. I was really curious what he would play, but I definitely expected something hyper modern. He went d, or I'm sorry, I went d4 because, you know, take the full center. That's what I teach and I preach what I teach and I teach what I preach and I do what I preach. Wait, what's the, I don't know what saying I was going for. It didn't really work. Sorry about that. And then he went b6. Hmm. I'm starting to wonder if this is the real position because it kind of looks like he's playing checkers instead of chess. But no, nah, this is totally fine still. Um, it's just flexible still. Bishop d3 by me. Yeah, and I do believe that in Owen's defense, one of the main ideas is to put the bishop on b7, a knight on f6, and you just attack e4. And it's a little uncomfortable to... Um, to uh, deal with, and actually, I, it, it, it actually is in conjunction with e6 usually. So I'll tell you that. So usually it would go like this, like b6 here, e6, or uh, transpose. And then after bishop d3, getting ready for this bishop to hit, which it does, then knight to f6. So like, let's say I go here, knight to f6. Okay, it's attacked twice, right? Now, if you protect with a knight, they can pin that knight. Now they're threatening that again. And then if I go queen to e2, they will usually take here and try to play against my double pawns. Now, I don't think that's so easy to do. I'd still take white here, but I've got two bishops. I literally don't care about my double pawns. I've got a center. If I ask the engine, it's probably gonna say white's a bit better. I'm asking it. Yep, it says white's plus 0.7 which is better than a normal advantage for white. So I would still play this happily as white, but um, good players will know how, know the plans associated with this and will make it a difficult game. So I do think that this combination of d6, b6 is, you know, passive already. Passive already. It weakens light squares, and it doesn't go for that plan I just suggested because the bishop is blocked and cannot make the pin on the knight on c3. So that's my assessment of that. We'll see if my coach agrees with me. Bishop d3, bishop b7, and now knight to f3. Theory gives knight to f3 against Owen's defense. In all honesty, I don't like playing it because I like to play pawn to f4 in these types of positions. And if I have to go pawn c3, I'm just fine with that. I want my pawn at f4 and then castle with the rook behind it. That's what I generally would like. But I went ahead and played knight to f3 because the position is just too flexible still. I don't really know what's going on. I felt like I should control the center more. So knight d7, c4, let's take some more space. e6, knight c3. My knights are now on the best squares for them, the best opening squares, which control the center squares. Controlling the center is good, kids, if you're watching. Knight g to f6, castles, 
Yeah, Castles is, was a hard decision, actually. Um, he's playing a little bit of, of cat and mouse with me, and I was aware of that. He's he's not really giving away where he's going to castle at all, right? Like, is he going to go bishop e7 and go short? Or is he going to do something different? Like, like e5, d5, knight c5, queen d7, castle long. This is also very possible. Um, this whole situation with the knight on d7, black often waits for white to commit a pawn so they can take advantage of the weaknesses. So the best thing you can do in this position, in my opinion, unless it turns out one of the moves works really well, is to leave the center and restrict the black pieces. And the longer you restrict them, the better. Um, so that's my assessment of that. So I castle, he went h6, I guess he didn't want, to, I don't know why he played h6. I think, I think that he was planning on g5 potentially, and then g4. That is what I think, and then castle long. So, but I don't know that for sure, because there was no threat of anything coming to g5 really. Yeah, and then here I went 91, but okay, I, I had to think a while here because the white position is good, but it's a little awkward. My pieces can't really go anywhere. Like I can't really break anywhere too good. Like I was saying, if I go here, um, I thought he could just simply take, right? And if I take here, he'll take with the knight and take. And I don't want to do that. That destroys my center, the bishop opens etc. I don't I don't want to open up the game so fast, I don't think, and destroy my center. So I can't really do that. If I do this one and he goes e5, the reason I didn't want to do this is that the black pawns are aimed at the white uh, king side. My pawns are aimed this way. That means my play's on the queen side. I would have to go for b5. That is currently not as easy to get in for me. It would take longer. And I just thought my ideas there are, I don't know, they're probably fine, but not looking that amazing or anything. And again, uh, he would have the attack on my king side. So after this and this, he could play for f5, you know, stuff like knight h7, f5, knight back to f6, and he would attack my king side with f5. Um, I would have to move this knight, play f3. It's more of like a king's Indian defense type thing where black's pushing on the king side. I wasn't interested in that either. So I took my own advice and I left the pawns. And I thought, you know what? I like to play f4, my knight's in the way, knight e1. I'm gonna play f4. And what I'm saying is his pieces are cramped and stuff. And even if I give him several moves, that my position will still be better. And I can improve my position better than he can improve his because I have more space. So I'm taking advantage of my space advantage. So now you might be thinking, well, Stacia, why didn't you go knight h4? I don't know about this move because I feel like after things like this, I'm not so sure, right? Like, is that a free knight? I take it, um, and then they take that. I, I, I don't know. I guess I've checked. Um, no, I don't even have checked. That that just loses more material. <laughs> so like, I don't know. I, I'm not looking to lose the knight on h4. So that's why I went knight to e1. I thought this is fine. So. I'm not allowed to check with the engine. I'll check the opening book. No positions. What a surprise. There's one position here and white one. They played d5 in that game. Hmm. Okay, anyway, um, let's continue. I went knight to e1. And he went ahead and played e5. e5 is probably fine. It actually fights for more center. And he also saw the fact that, you know, if I take, I just think that's bad. Um, 
maybe not actually. It's probably also good. But I went d5. He told me after the game he wasn't expecting this move. He was expecting me to do a pawn break early. Which, okay, fair enough. That's something I would do. <laughs> but I didn't feel the need here. Uh, what I like about pawn to d5 in this position is that I really didn't see why I couldn't go for f4 anyway. Um, and I thought I could do so. And his bishop is now shut out, is what I thought. And, well, the bishop can come here. So I do have to worry about that. But it's not even clear where his king's going. But it will be a while before he castles. So I went d5, expecting knight c5, which he did do. So I saved my bishop. I actually wanted to keep that bishop. a5 by him, stopping b4. This is a common move to secure your knight on c5. You play a5 to stop this. And, you know, the truth is I could go a3 and try to go for it. Let's say he just goes here or something. Um, yeah, this still doesn't work because guess what? My rook's hanging. So it would take a while for me to kick out the knight. So I think that a5 was a good move. Um, so black has like an active piece. A pretty decent piece. Bishop's not on e7 yet though. So I went queen e2 here. I didn't really want to play queen e2, but here's the thing. I want to go knight d3 and challenge this knight. This was my whole idea of letting it there. Um, I actually want him to take me, but at some moment I might take him if the moment is right. Uh, Cause that's like his one really good piece, right? The bishops are blocked. Not knight, I'm not sure about. So, but I can't do this here because guess what? He just takes that. And then after this, this, maybe I have something crazy. I don't know. But then maybe he has something crazy. And then maybe I have something crazy. Like, I don't know. There's no need to calculate this, I thought. This looks like silliness to me. So I should just not let him take the pawn. So I'm queen e2. In a slow game, by the way, I would calculate all that out <laughs> because I like chess. What can I tell you? It's probably not smart to do it, but I would. <laughs> all right. Um, queen d7. So now he's kind of hinting that he's going to go queenside. So that's the problem with my position, right? Is that I can't full force set up an attack anywhere because it's not clear where the attack should be. So because of that, we continue this cat and mouse game quite a while. Um, well, maybe not that much longer. I do go knight d3 here. Let's improve my piece, right? When I do know where to attack, my knight will not be on e1, it'll be on d3. He played bishop b7. Now he's really saying like, which way am I going, Stacia? <laughs> try to guess and I start salivating no I'm kidding I was salivating a little bit so then I go a3 I'm like look I don't care which way you castle I have an attack everywhere because that's that's what I do <laughs> if you want to go king side you have to deal with f4 if you want to go queen side you've got to deal with probably this move first and then b4 and I will blow up either side so that was what I was thinking. So he went knight takes d3 here. I want queen takes. I want access to uh, these squares over here in case he goes king side. But if queen side, I think the queen is well placed to go this way, this way. Looking good. He castled finally on the king side. Okay. So he's finally uh, developed. You could argue that he is better developed than me, but I could argue back because I think the bishop on c1 is actually basically developed. It's aiming at h6. It's a very powerful piece. Yes, I'm going to think about sacrifices every single move. And if I have to spend a tempo and get the other rook in or something, I'm okay with that too. So I just went f4 immediately. Let's go f4. I'm not sure if this is the best move or not, but I kind of think it is. It increases my space advantage. It improves my rook. And black is sort of like, uh, well, their bishop 
is locked in. It might be developed, I guess, but not really because it's complete trash here, right? Unless black can open up the center, which would be hard to do, then this bishop will remain blocked. So I was basically playing f4 on the fact that this bishop and this rook hasn't moved either. So any attack that I might get going will have some steam to it. And I think he knew that, you know, Butch wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> he knows I'm going to attack him. So he played queen to g4. I mean, what better defender than the queen, right? But um, the queen can get harassed. So that was the first thing I thought. So I played bishop e3. Okay, I just want to get my other rook ready to come in. I had ideas of like rook e3 and, you know, let's bring, let's bring the rooks into the party, right? So um, knight d7 by him. I actually was more afraid of knight h7, to be honest with you. But on knight h7, I could go for like f5 type stuff. No, that doesn't even work. Never mind. Yeah, actually, this move is annoying because if I do go f5, black gets really good, good control of g5. And they can trade things off there on that spot. So I didn't like, I, I wasn't looking forward to knight h7, even though it looks kind of passive, it does defend. But he went knight d7. Playing for activity, boo, never play for activity. No, I'm just kidding. Playing for activity is good. Black does need some counterplay, but I don't know. This one piece in a four horse town or five horse town, I don't know if that's going to be anything at all. You can attack my queen if you like. I'll probably see it. I might not see it, but if I do see it, I'm going to move my queen, something like that. So I think knight d7, I have to ask my coach. I'm going to mark this one. We'll see what my coach says. Because I'm not allowed to use the engine. I don't know if I told you guys that. <laughs> I can use the opening book, but I have to really limit my engine use until I look at this game with my coach. So we're all going to explore these mysteries together. Actually, tell me what you think in the comments. You guys, I really would love to hear from you guys more. Like, why don't you comment more? Like, tell me, do you like knight h7 better for black or knight d7? I think knight d7 isn't right. Prove me wrong. So um, I went rook to f3 because I literally don't care about knight c5. And he went knight c5. And I just simply moved my queen because, you know, I actually saw it. Who knew that I could see such a thing? Then he went bishop. Oops, wait. Then he went bishop h4. Yeah. So why did he go bishop h4? Well, Butch, like I was saying, he wasn't born yesterday. Okay, he wasn't born yesterday. Let's say he played something like rook to e8. I don't know. I'm just going to play a random move because I want to show my threat. My threat was, I'm going to take this pawn now. Okay, if you take the pawn back. Yes, you weaken the knight. I don't really care about that. What I care about is this. Boom. Win the pawn. If you take rook g2, I win your queen. That's game over. So, he saw this idea. So, he actually played a reasonable move. Bishop h4. Hey, now I can't put my rook there. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so I played f5 here. Yeah, this is a hard decision, actually. I was starting to get lower on time. And I just kept loving this idea of pawn to f5. And the whole reason I did this is because he's using his queen to defend. And the queen is capable of getting harassed. Moves like h3, moves like bishop d1, moves like rook g2 maybe later um there's just a lot of ideas to attack that queen and that queen just might get trapped too i was seeing lines where she might get trapped so i play pawn to f5 the other nice thing about pawn to f5 which does close the position it does keep the rook blocked that's the downside right um is that i could play pawn to f6 at some moment and if i get pawn to f6 that is often just a really strong move. And I didn't used to appreciate just how strong 
that is when a pawn makes it to f6. But if it didn't, if it doesn't uh, ring that bell for you, then just watch the rest of this game, <laughs> okay? Because I didn't really, after I get pawned f6, like everything just flowed really naturally. And let's see what you guys think. So he went bishop g5 here. Yeah, this was a downside of this order taking is the fact that he does get control of g5. I didn't know this. Now, I, I'm not one to initiate trades, right? I want, I have more space. I have more space and potential attack. That means I want to avoid trades and I want to improve my position, improve the attack. So rook a to f1, he did take my bishop. Okay, fine. I took with a queen. Queen g5, please trade queens with me. No, <laughs> not trading queens today, Jacoby Matt, if you're watching. <laughs> Okay. No, I don't even think Jacoby Matt would trade queens here. I really don't think he would. He's too good for that now. Queen d8. Yeah, so Butch saw the danger. Butch sees the danger. You know, he's not a bad player at all. Like, he knows that I want to trap his queen. I'm threatening to play rook, G, rook d3 with very mean things involved. So he retrieves his queen. Makes a lot of sense. But now I get to play that dream move. You guessed it, F6. I'm giving it an exclam, not the computer. So I do this because, I don't know, it's what I think it is. And then I'll analyze with my coach. Then we'll ask the computer after I review with my coach. And if any of you guys are superior, uh, superior, if you're superior than me, then why are you watching my channel and not teaching me? Okay, anyway. <laughs> now, if any of you guys are wondering, you know, why you're not improving at chess, then definitely heed these words, okay? This is what strong players tell me over and over again. They say, don't use the engine when you analyze, at least not right away. Make your own conclusions first. Analyze with a strong player first. Only then use the engine. So I'm not against the engine at all. I use it all the time, of course. Uh, but I will say that if you want to actually improve at chess, you've got to do a serious analysis without the engine. And after you do, after you come up with some conclusions, then you check with the engine. The engine's a powerful tool, you know. But you should whatever you would calculate in a real game, you. Put that in, you know, put that in your game or write it down, pen, pad and paper. I mean, if you're old like me, you kind of like pad and paper a little bit. Sometimes I like to physically write the moves. Um, and then uh, check with the engine after, you know. Check exactly what you wrote down and compare it with reality. Well, reality is uh, maybe not the right word because the engines could change their minds uh, five years from now or two years from now. But... Um, Anyway, that's why I'm play, putting this in, in here. Because it will stand out that I think this is very strong and probably winning. I think it's winning. Let's see what you guys think. He has to play g6. I mean, what else are you going to do? I really don't think you can allow me to take here. I don't. It's going to be a tempo there. And then this pawn's weak. <laughs> I just go here, here, take, and rook over and rook. I, I don't know. I, it just... I'm not even going to analyze it. It looks impossible for a black to hold. G6 is what I thought, but all of these moves come so natural now. Attack the pawn on H6. King H7, I calculated. Rook H3. I'm threatening to take there with like meeting two, right? Check here and checkmate. So I thought if Rook G8, you know, to stop that, I get mating one. <laughs> so he can't do that. So h5 and here queen g5. Okay, I don't even know that I need queen g5. I'm not sure about that. I actually, no, maybe I do actually. I think I do need queen g5. Okay, I do. Um, why do I think that? Because I think if I sack the rook right now and then play queen g5, now I think rook g8 might be a real move. Oh, it's not. That's checkmate. Never mind. 
Yeah, there, there's no way out of this either. I'll check with the engine because this is very concrete. Mate and three. Okay, mate and three is good enough for me. Uh, so I could do that too. I want queen g5. So maybe my move's worse, but I don't think it is. I think it's the same thing. Um, he went bishop c8. Okay. Finally, the bishop, you know, that's been blocked the entire game says, hey, put me in, coach. And it is to the detriment of the rook, which is probably why Butch wouldn't do this earlier. He was hoping to get his rook back in. But as you'll remember, the queen actually came out and defended and stuff and then came back to d8, blocking that rook. But now, I mean, it's pretty much too little, too late. So the bishop is attacking my rook. Well, what should I do? Where can I move that rook? You guys already know. <laughs> rook takes. Rook takes. H5. Sacrifice the rook. Yeah, of course sacrifice the rook. Because after takes, check. And, I mean, the control of the square is just too much. So, there, check, there. And mate. And, um... I bet my chess girls, Abby and Suhani, would be all over that checkmate. I'm just telling you, they did a lot of puzzles recently, and they are, like, faster than me now. Like, I hate it. I kind of hate it when that happens, but I kind of like it. Like, as a teacher, I'm super excited. As a player, I'm like, oh, man, more kids passing me up. But as a teacher, I'm like, Abby's so great. Suhani's so great. But as a player, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this means Abby's going to play me a tournament and beat me? And then Suhani will beat me next. <laughs> like, it's just not... <laughs> yeah, as a player, it's disappointing. I'm not going to lie. But any adults out there, you know what I'm talking about. The kids, they improve very fast. Okay? And I work with them very closely. And I see with my own eyes. And I'm not even sure I teach them in the most optimal way. I'm not sure that I do. I mostly... Uh, mostly is a bit much. 50% I motivate them. 50% I teach, but also make it fun while I'm teaching. So it's not always as objective as it could be, but I think a truly 100% objective player um, would, would bore them a bit. And I think they might lose interest, especially the kids that I work with. Usually the parents are like, my child's about to quit chess, please help. Okay, if they're about to quit chess because they don't think chess is fun, I'm your teacher, right? Like, I love chess so much. It's just infectious. I can spread that to the kids. Plus, I love kids. Uh, so I'll pat them on the head. <laughs> pat them on the head while uh, showing them why chess is so much fun. And, and and you know, the kids, the kids that I work with, they're all smart kids. And they're already drawn to chess. They just need a little confidence boost usually. They're already super smart and could do great. They usually just need me to nurse them forward a bit. I'm happy to do it. Uh, when my coaches do that for me, same result. I need someone to believe in me the same way. I'm an adult, but maybe I am I might be more immature than most. Uh, man, I'm really spilling the beans tonight. Sorry, you guys. Um, yeah, I might be Im more immature than a lot of adults. I, do, I don't doubt it. I'm more emotional and sensitive than a lot of adults. Um, you could joke it's because I'm female or whatever, but uh, I think it's more than a lot of females, too, to be honest with you. Um, and sensitive males. There's plenty of sensitive males. I don't want to act like it's only female. <laughs> that, oh, gosh. I painted myself on a corner. Why do you guys do that to me? Okay, I did it to myself. I don't truly believe that females are like way more sensitive than males, but of course society, some people in society pair with that. So I was simply addressing that. But anyway, um, I just think I am more that way, not because of my gender necessarily. I just am that way. Um, and so my point is that a coach that is encouraging and truly believes in you. And I don't, I think it has to be genuine. Okay. Like platitudes are not going to cut it. It has to come from the heart. There has to be a connection even with that coach. So this is what I experienced with my coaches. If my coach really believes in me, I feel it. And that energy actually improves my results because my results are not based on my knowledge. Mostly it's based on my confidence that day 
It's based on how much I believe I'm good at chess or that I can do it, that I can win. It's how much I believe in myself that day that really dictates the results more than anything. If I were to be 100% honest. So when I work with, uh, you know, students, adult or children, um, I, I try to provide that. Obviously, if I don't believe in somebody, that's going to be difficult. And I'm sure it doesn't really happen quite the way I want. But, man, the kids that I meet, they are wired for chess already. And they're super smart, most of them. Um, they remind me of me when I was growing up. I'm not saying I'm super smart, but I was in the gifted program. And I excelled and had excellent grades. And I was really into school, school work, I guess. Uh, the social part wasn't as successful, <laughs> but, um, so these kids, I understand, let me put it that way. I relate to them and I do believe in them. So I, once I do believe in them, I try to show them that as much as possible. And I think that is what they need more than anything. That is my opinion. I know I went way off the rails on this game, but if you've hung in there this long, Okay, we're going to do our recap because I do have um, one final topic that I think is actually probably the most important of this whole video that I'm going to harp on here. And yeah, lucky you if you're listening, you will get a nice nugget of knowledge here. So I played Butch and Butch, you know, played this passive opening, just staying solid. Okay, and I'm going to tell you something. Bush said after the game, and this is a totally valid approach, right? Um, I'm not saying this is a stupid approach. I'm not. But I'm simply trying to talk this through a bit. Okay, I want to talk it through a bit. Because um, it is a smart approach and sometimes it works. But I'm going to tell you something about it that you might not know. And the next thing I will share might be really good for you if you haven't heard it before. Because I've heard strong players say this. I've heard chess grandmaster commentators say this. But it applies here. My opponent said, I know you're an aggressive player. I'm going to play solid. And you are going to break early. And, okay, that's all he's told me was he expected me to break early. But I know what he means. What he means is I might overextend myself and he'd be there to, uh, you know, let me fall on my own head and then clean up the mess and mop me up, right? I mean, that is a strategy against aggressive players. You can taunt them. You can provoke them. And when they overextend and they attack a little too early... Uh, you know, you have counterattacking chances, or they could just sack and blunder a piece. Things of this nature, it's definitely a real way to beat aggressive players. I have lost that way many, many times. But as I've learned more about chess and I've grown as a player, uh, I've gotten better at not doing that so much. And like I did this game, just holding the center. Okay, I'm not going to break super early. I'm just going to hold my center use my space advantage to improve my position better than you can with your lack of space, right? Like I can maneuver my knights if I want, right? This knight could come to g3, for example. I could do something like, I don't know. Um, I could do something like this and try to, you know, if here I get the e4 square for my knight. I don't know. I'm just making up stuff because that's still not there. <laughs> But I'm just saying that if you have more space, you have more potential for your pieces. I could go to knight b5. If we look at black's position, it's not as easy, right? Like, this knight could go to g4. He'll get kicked. He'll get kicked. He can't go there. If he goes there, he gets captured. So that makes knight g4 not look so good. Because after h3, probably the best move is knight right back where it was. Where it blocks the other knight. This other knight can't go anywhere. He literally has nothing. The only way he ever will go anywhere is if I push a pawn, right? If I push a pawn, this knight then gets a future. So 
I'm trying to describe to you the fact that um, if you want to play an aggressive player, this come and get me style, not only, okay, and this is the shocker, not only is it not a good strategy, okay, it's what I freaking live for. Okay, I'm going to tell you that. When I see come and get me chess, I literally start getting excited because I know how to beat come and get me chess. They stay solid and then I have an advantage. I maneuver better. I wait to the right moment and I calculate. I didn't used to do that, okay? I would just go on intuition, attack too early or like mess up. I'm better now at, you know, knowing when this is just winning, you know, and now I'm ready to to go for the checkmate. This happens this game, right? This very game. If you already forgot, look at what happens here. I wait for him to castle. He castled. F4 immediately. I'm not messing around, okay? F4 is committal, but not committal. Okay, They're, the black pieces are passive. He already recognized that. Okay, so he's defending. Okay, I take advantage of the queen. The queen is the one overextended, right? I can go F5 and almost trap the queen in some lines. In fact, I come with this nice idea of takes, takes, oops, takes, takes, and rook G3. Yeah, tactics flow from a superior position. The white position is superior here. So I was looking for tricks and they do work in my favor. Bishop H4, again, it, this is not counterplay. It's like, it's just defense. It's black trying to desperately stop white. So I don't have to really even respond to it necessarily, right? I can continue improving. So I went F5. And this was, this is a bit committal, but I'm saying, okay, your queen might get trapped, right? Like bishop d1 could come. Do you really want to deal with that? And if you do that, maybe I'll go rook h3 when you move away, attacking the bishop. When the bishop moves away, maybe I have a real attack on the king. There's just so many ideas here for white. So I'm not committing to anything here. I'm just improving my position bring the other rook in the game. Yes, I had to trade off that bishop, but to me, these trades uh, are actually beneficial for white. Now, why would I say that? When you're attacking, don't trade. Okay, well, that's a little too general. What I really want to say is don't trade <laughs> your, two, your two defensive pieces off, because if you do that, what pieces are you left with? Well, you're left with these guys. Um, is he defending the king? In some alternate universe, this bishop is sitting proudly on h7 defending the king, but not in this one. And in some alternate universe, this knight's on h7. Uh, not in this one. So I do want to trade off the defensive piece because then my pieces will become stronger. And this knight, yeah, he's not that great, but there were, there are ideas of eventually getting this. I don't know if that's still possible, actually. I don't know. So there's still ideas of this though. <laughs> All right, so takes, takes. And I mean, look what happens here. After F6, and F6 is the move that, I think that's that's the move that's like, okay, I'm done maneuvering and improving. Like, I'm just, I'm ready to go. Let's just do it. So, and after this, the attack just, it flowed for itself there. I mean, none of these moves are difficult at all. They're all super easy. So it was a result of a superior position. So if we go back to what I was saying now, right? This come and get me style, okay, is, is actually the worst way to play against an aggressive player. Unless that aggressive player is not that good at chess, like if they're still 1400 or less or whatever, then maybe it is the right way. Um, because they're way more likely to um, overextend and just sack for no reason and just lose material. Okay, the end. But if you're going to play a good player, and I'm not saying I'm good. I did good this game, but believe me, I could screw this up. I could. I just didn't this time. Although I don't think I'm going to lose the way I used to because I, I, I actually do learn still as an old person. <laughs> um... 
but here's the breakthrough and a lot of you guys figure this out if you face an aggressive player you know the one thing they hate they hate to be attacked they hate to be attacked and i'm not even talking about counterattacking. that will work but i'm talking about sack upon and go after them um i can tell you that the most uncomfortable positions i get I'm sharing this at the end of a long video for a reason, right? Like, I don't want my opponents clicking through the video knowing my secrets. Well, if they're listening, I regret this a little. But, um, yeah, I don't like to be attacked. That's what I really fear. It's people that are aggressive. They put pressure on my position, and I cannot play with the initiative. I'm stuck defending. And guess what I'm not good at because I don't do it much? Defending. It's my worst quality as a chess player. Um... If I have another one, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, this turned into a bit of a lecture, but uh, a good one, I hope. I, I mean, this was uh, an epiphany for me at some point, so I hope that anybody listening, that uh, it's an epiphany for you. It might not be. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe it helped solidify the idea, but um, I definitely am talking to myself as well. So, <laughs> So I got something out of it, even if you guys didn't. But my real hope is that you got something out of it as well. So this is Stacia, and I'll be back with the final game of the Victorious Night in Parma. See you then. Bye.